morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today to learn this, about this very important topic of accessibility. How do you gauge accessibility? Each person's accessibility needs are different. There are multiple components of a trip. And when traveling with accessibility needs, all of these components need to be met. How many of those boxes are you checking in your destination? The American Disability Act is designed to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else, but it's really the baseline and it's necessary, but not all encompassing. So how can we as an industry be more inclusive and why should we be, other than the fact that it's the right thing to do? You'll notice in this presentation um, that through the PowerPoint, we have done an accessibility check in order to make sure that the PowerPoint is accessible. We have also added um, closed captioning to this. These are a couple of different things that you can do when doing presentations to your partners and others in the industry in order to make it more accessible. So today we will have Christina Rogers with our agency of record, Luke Wire, who will be providing the business case on why everyone should be accessible in our marketing of destinations. And then we'll have Jessica Holt with Visit Raleigh, who will take a deeper dive into the incredible work Visit Raleigh is doing to be more an inclusive destination including their recent assessment with partners for the All Access Waste County Program, as well as preparation for hosting the 2022 Leadership Exchange and Arts and Disability Conference. We'll wrap up with some key takeaways and resources. Feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A at any time, and we'll have a few minutes at the end to address those. So we'll go ahead and get started with Christina. I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. So as content director, I work daily with the teams that are responsible for content and strategy on our own channels. So that is organic social, email, websites, all of the digital properties that you use to bring your brand and your story to life. And so today I'm excited to talk about and help folks better understand the need for accessibility in the digital space, as well as the potential for return on any investment of time or money or effort that you put into that that accessibility enhancement, because um, that always helps with buy-in and with key stakeholder um, adoption of the approach. So today, why are we taking measures to make our digital channels more accessible? We're doing it not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's also good for business. Go to the next slide. This is a quick level set, sort of why this topic, why now? Um, I don't think this will come as news to a lot of folks on this channel, but businesses and services, they already were continuing to move into the physical, move from their physical offerings to their online offerings, whether it be brick and mortar turning to an online store, or whether it be, you know, offering healthcare services and telehealth and those things, taking it online. Um, post pandemic consumers are seeking more and more services and information online than ever before, and they're showing no sign of going back to the old ways. So that is definitely the climate and the landscape right now. What does that mean in this context? That means that just as we take steps to ensure there are no barriers to services or products or information in accordance with the ADA we, in our physical spaces, we also have to think about how that translates to our online spaces and ensure that there are no barriers for people with visual impairment, auditory impairment, fine motor dexterity challenges. The range, as Amanda said, the range of disabilities is broad and all of them can affect the way that your users, your followers interact with your digital content. Uh, we could go to the next slide. So also important, I'm going to give you guys two acronyms that as you start to dive in, for some of you, these may be familiar. For those who are kind of new to learning about accessibility in the digital space, these may be new. But these two acronyms will come up and they will be helpful just to know what they are at the onset. The first is WCAG, stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. This is a federal a list of federal guidelines that are um, largely developed in response to the the uh, the explosion of the internet and trying to take what what um, guidelines are in place in the ADA and translate that into something that's useful in the online space. They are not yet official regulation, like enforceable federal regulations like the ADA, but they are out there they are continuing to be adopted and evolved there's multiple layers and levels to them and people are um subject to 
to repercussions if they don't follow them. So just to kind of give the lay of the land, these accessibility guidelines do exist and it is wise to follow them for a number of reasons that we'll get into. WCAG. The next acronym um, is POOR, which sorry for the dad joke, but I find to be somewhat of a poor acronym, but it is important because basically this is a way to understand what the, the goal of the WCAG are, right? Web content accessibility guidelines are ensuring that our content is poor, but not poor. Perceivable, that means that people, you know, users of all abilities can perceive the information. So you're not relying solely on the ability to see or hear or a certain fine motor skill to experience your information. It's operable. It means your site works right or your or your channel works right. You know, you got to make sure that for anyone who needs to make any sort of adjustment for accessibility, it's operable. It's understandable. This is where um, proper tagging and letting letting a screen reader, for example, know this is a title. This is this is making sure your navigation is such that someone who maybe can't read or hear or they're relying on a different way to access your information is able to understand it as well as anyone who would be interacting it with it in a more traditional way and that it's robust so this is something that you know we can we are ensuring that um we are putting our content together and thinking through our content in a way that is compelling and rich for people of all abilities using all sorts of technologies and it, and it even in an adjustment it's not lost or diminished in any way so p-o-u-r poor all right with that as our ground rules, okay. Leading off with like, hey, there's a long list of rules and guidelines, not the most fun. And that's what we wanna really, I wanna really shine a light on is historically accessibility has been sort of considered a chore. Like I've gotta do this, uh, there's these rules I have to follow or I'm gonna get in trouble. And really that's not something that is um, exciting. That's not something that speaks to the, the why behind it. That's not a real why. I mean, it's like a consequence, but it's not really why you wanna do it. And that's what I wanna show is that this can actually be strategic. This can be, um, it's, this is a, a values-based decision as well as a business-based decision. So we wanna move, how accessibility has been thought of as sort of a CYA measure to avoid lawsuits. And we want to say, no, no, this is actually a strategic and brand building business opportunity. We want to say, no, it's not just when I'm thinking about how much resources to devote to it. It's not just cost risk assessment. It's actually like, well, if I invest in this now, what's the return on that investment? There's potential for market reach and profit that I would not have otherwise been able to tap into. And then there's also this element, and I know that you all work on teams of various sizes with various creative minds working to produce content that's dynamic and engaging. And sometimes it can be seen as like, oh, I've got to follow all these rules, make sure it's accessible. It's a damper on my creative. And really it's not. When your whole team can understand and, and get behind and start planning content in accordance with these guidelines and the why behind it, you're actually putting in place a framework to ensure that your great creative can be experienced by more people. So it's not so much limiting as creative, it's actually expanding it. Um, when you have those conversations, when you start to think, okay, I've got to find time and and resources to devote to accessibility and, and I want to do a, some, some work on my channels, it helps with buy-in to have some tangible, some stats at your fingertips. I know that. So, you know, very often the reality is we do need to make that business case. So here's how we can start. The first one is that avoid risk. It's not what should be our driving reason for this, but it is still there and it is still present. In fact, you know, 80% of the top e-commerce companies, that's of course a large, a large area for online goods and services is the e-commerce. 80% um, have been sued in the last four years. So that's not going to be our driving go you know this is why you need to do this we have to avoid getting sued but it is important to know that <clears throat> every year that that um, line is going up for the number of cases that get brought against sites that are inaccessible the next one is 490 billion in disposable income for working age people with disabilities so certainly when you're thinking about market reach understanding that there's this great spending potential and you would never want to put in place an unintentional barrier to them accessing your information or your goods or services in any way. Um, the, I have a travel specific one in the next slide, but this last one before we jump to that one is really brand enhancement. And this one is a little bit less concrete, but it is very interesting when you think about it. So 80% of customers, consumers agree that the experience of a brand is as important as your products or services. So when you think about that, if they land on a site and it is unpleasant for them to work with, that's a reflection of your brand. 
And they immediately are going to say, my experience with that brand is not right. In fact, there's a stat that's equally as high, 70 or 80% of people, if they encounter a site that is inaccessible or, or un, unpleasant and bad user experience, they will bounce never to return. Like you've got that one time to make a first impression and keep them and the risk of them not coming back is significant. So this is also a reflection on your brand in terms of the person's experience with your brand. On the next slide, this one is specific to the travel industry. Um, there was 58 billion in annual travel spend in the US by travelers with disabilities. Okay, so that's that potential again, thinking about that potential market. And we all know that a travel experience is going to start, it starts long before they arrive and they can, you know, utilize your physical facilities, which are so important for accessibility, but they we need to consider accessibility when they're researching travel, when they're trying to be inspired to travel, when they're looking for things to do, when they have a question. So that's where our digital channels come in. We're actually meeting them in their travel journey long before they actually start to have to utilize physical accommodations. And that's where these channels come into play. Um, to debunk that myth that it's hampering creative in case we need to hit it home, here are three websites across different verticals that are very dynamic, very rich, uh, robust, P-O-U-R, all those things. Um, and they certainly don't feel that they were limited by adhering to those um, accessibility standards for you know, they've got bold text, they've got exciting visuals, they've got video, they've just set it up in such a way that they have made intentional choices to ensure that that content is accessible for all. This is one approach, building your site with that in mind. Another approach you guys have seen this increasingly, I'm sure, tools like Accessibility and others, they're, they have there's an embed you can put on your site that allows a user to make their own adjustments to the site for their specific needs. Um, another great option in, in meeting them where they are and offering them an alternative way to get information so that there, that there are no unintentional barriers. And then, of course, we've got our social channels, right? And here it's you have a little less control because you don't own the actual platform, right? We don't own it like you would a, a website or a um, you know your your email client, but you you so you need to work within the parameters of Instagram or or you know Facebook. But there are some things you can do to make your posts as accessible as possible. Um, and the first is the way that you utilize emojis. Um, the when you think about it, people, so if someone were using a screen reader, you're relying on that screen reader to read the emoji exactly in the way that you intended it. And because there are multiple words or adjectives that one might ascribe to that emoji, you've got to be considerate about where and when you place it. And there's even a dictionary um, that I, I provide, I'll provide the link at the end um, to a resource where you can check how a screen reader would read your emoji um, before you place it there. But just thinking about them, Placing your emojis in the beginning or the end of phrases rather than in the middle, that's a great way to eliminate any potential confusion or misinterpretation there. Um, if you if you are using it as um, an enhancement to post copy, making sure that it's not replacing a word, but you're using an emoji in addition to that word. So you're not relying on the emoji to tell the story, those types of things. Talking a lot about emojis, but the bottom line is that they when you're in when you're in a social platform, this is how people talk. This is how people communicate. And so it's not to say that your brand can't have that kind of fun and have that sort of dialogue that, that your followers are participating in and expecting of the channel. It's just making small intentional choices to ensure that all of your followers are experiencing it the same way. Same thing with hashtags. Absolutely can use them. Yes, they get mashed together, but at least from a quick visual enhancement, visual help is you can use title case to make them more readable instead of all lowercase, right? That's a small adjustment, but it can make a big difference. I know it helps me and I don't even necessarily have any sort of visual impairment, but I like to read them that way. Um, anytime you're including visual uh, videos or imagery on your channels, absolutely make sure closed captioning is on there. That can depending on the channel and depending on your needs, it can be done manually, it can be done through the channel. YouTube will auto-generate captions, but you usually want to go back in behind it and make some updates because it's about 65-70% um, accurate. You want to make grammar and spelling changes, but captions for sure. Um, and then images with alt text, right? So there are different, depending on how you upload, whether it's right to the channel or maybe you use a software a tool that, that you plan your post out ahead of time, 
increasingly those tools are allowing for you to embed alt text in your images that means you're adding a description of what the image is in text to the image itself that will that will be on the back end and will be able to be read by a screen reader or you know interpreted by people interacting with that content differently um where possible do that they don't all have that capability yet but that is where this is going and i don't see that going away so keeping in mind that anytime you do have the option to add alt text to your images do so um, the, there's that acronym again, WCAG. Those content guidelines do have advice for contrast and certain color choices, and, and really it's a ratio between your colors. So if you start to have a lot of um, graphics or uh, slides that are more, more graphical in nature, um, understanding that there are certain color choices and contrast that make them more readable, that's helpful to know. Um, and then um, in terms of interactivity, again, you can't make a lot of custom choices when it comes to things like putting a poll on Instagram, but you can adjust the size of it. So thinking about someone who might have a dexterity challenge of some sort, having a teeny, teeny, tiny radio button or slider versus one that you can magnify ever so slightly, you know, make it fill the screen a bit more. That's another way to say, hey, you know, we're making this as easy to interact with as possible. Okay, so I just threw a lot at you, but hopefully it's helping to understand the importance and also the real value in taking these approaches. And it can seem like, especially if this is new or newer to you, it can seem like, oh my gosh, where do I start? And so I tried to do that here. And for really doable accessibility measures you could take today, tomorrow, that will actually make a big difference. Um, so here's where we start. So with those guidelines, those web content accessibility guidelines, and we will provide a link to those as well. They have they've evolved over time, as has the internet and needs. So level 2.1 double A, and you get in there. There's a lot of a lot of bullets, and so it's an outline from you know some crazy depths. But it is um, that's best practice to try to get to level 2.1 and double A, be in compliance with that. Um, there's a lot to that though. So let's start by identifying some low hanging fruit. And this is a great way. I mean, any steps in the right direction are good steps, all right? So you don't have to suddenly check off every single bullet on that list of guidelines. If you can do some of these, you are in a good track. For example, alt text we talked about. Running a scan of your website, there are free tools and plugins. Like there's one called the wave evaluation tool. Um, that one, can't operate without a human. You still need human eyes behind it. It's not going to be a perfect silver bullet, but you can absolutely have that plug in and run an accessibility check and it's going to identify issues with color contrast, missing titles, missing alt text. It's going to show you where those things are. So that's one way you don't even need to bring in a, a, a developer necessarily to um, make those updates. Um, ensure title tags, link details, meta descriptions. That's all stuff on the back end in your CMS, which is just making sure those fields are filled in. Most, most certainly WordPress and some of the most common CMSs these days will have those fields and in some cases they may even auto populate them but it's good to run through and check that all of those are filled in again allowing for a screen reader to navigate your site and to convey your information the right way to the the person using it this one everyone could do this today get an accessibility statement together and include it on your website this is a perfect first step this is a perfect way to say hey it's a, it's a basic statement that says, if you encounter anything on this site, or if you encounter any difficulty in um, accessing information on this site, please contact here and give them a way to troubleshoot, okay? It's not necessarily, you know, this doesn't take the place of the other efforts, but it's a great first step in saying, we're working on this. And if you encounter anything we wanna know about it, we're not just gonna say, oh, you're out of luck. Um, and then make sure that that person is set up to respond in a timely manner. It can help for things like um, if you have PDFs on your website, making sure they're accessible, ideal. If you haven't gotten to all of them yet and someone encounters one that's not, they may email that you have that ready to go for them, that type, sort of thing. Um, this one is um, actually one of the most important, I think, because all of the others fall out of it, is really amplifying your commitments, your overt commitments to DE&I by adding accessibility to your company policy, right? This is part of your shared company ethos. So I think that Often DE and I, we think of certain types of, you know, diversity and inclusion. This is a big one, right? And and making a line in the sand that all of the content that we do and everything we go to market with, we're going to take intentional measures to uh, acknowledge and accommodate different needs for accessibility. 
that's huge. And then that's where it starts when everyone's operating from the same playbook and the same code of ethics, then it permeates the work that they do. So whether it's a creative person creating uh, you know, a piece for a channel or whether it's a developer setting up your site, making sure all of the accessibility foundation is laid, whether it's the way that your, your emails go out, whatever it may be, having that as a must have as a, as a core part of your company values is the place to start. And then really you're, you lead by example after this webinar and gosh, Jess is going to add so much more great tangible examples of how to do this, but committing for yourself to learn more about these accessibility guidelines, learn more about the potential there and sharing that knowledge with your team members. That is the great place to start, right? It's not to say, you know, all of this, you're not an expert immediately. It's learning, but committing to learning is what's the the, the best way to lead by example and get that buy-in across your, your company. So um, goodness gracious, for someone leading by example, that's actually the perfect transition. I didn't even plan it to turn it over to Jessica, who is, a phenomenal example of where these digital channels meet your destination. Thanks, Christina. And, you know, I want to start by saying we are still learning, still growing. Um, this is a long process. So what you're going to see here are some examples from years of work, even pre-pandemic, that we started and just how we've kind of done a slow roll of adding different components to our website, to our blogs, to trainings for hospitality partners, all, all various things to make our website and our destination more accessible. So I want to start with accessibility blogs. This is something that is a very easy way to get started. Most destinations already have blogs that they put out and doing accessibility blogs um, is an easy way to showcase various partners and the things that they're already doing, um, as well as events in your area and just different ways that folks can engage um, and feel comfortable and know that they're going to um, be welcomed and that all of their accessibility needs are going to be met at these various places. So these are just a few examples here. Um, you can see on the right hand side, these are some of our more recent blogs that we've done and we actually did a whole series on disability, the arts in Raleigh. So they are a little more arts focused. Um, this was in conjunction with our lead conference, which I will talk about shortly. But you can see we're just highlighting here some of the different um, you know, visual art exchange hosting a emerging young artist exhibition. Um, also working with the conventions, our Raleigh Convention Center, and how the, what accessibility components they have weaved in for, for rolling out the welcome mat and making that center more accessible. Also highlighting things like our North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, they have a museum sensory map. So again, this is not something that we created or we started. It's just relying on our partners in the destination to already see what they're doing and highlighting and showcasing that for them. Also our Marbles Kids Museum, they have family fun nights that are specific for kids with special abilities and needs. And so highlighting that to let parents and kids know their specific nights, if they're concerned about going to the museum and there being too many people or it being too loud, things like that, highlighting those specific nights so they can come and experience the museum beforehand with a little smaller crowd and a little more attention to detail. We also have our Page Walker Arts and History Center. Um, again, that center in Cary already has accessible guided tours. They also offer sign language interpretation. So part of that is just researching the initiatives that your partners are already doing and then highlighting those on your blogs. And then finally, our Sassafras All Children's Playground. Um, this is a wonderful newer playground in the city of Raleigh that's designed for children of all physical capabilities. Um, it has multiple components in it, certain components of play that are really focused on touch, that are accessible to children of all abilities. And again, just, you know, most people don't realize that that playground even exists in Raleigh. So highlighting that as an area to take your kids. Another thing you can do with this is also including um, with your blogs, highlighting any of those virtual tours that you may have. So again, your partners may already have virtual tours they're doing. Um, we did some 360 tours adding the, during the pandemic. So adding those 360 tours to our listings, that helps showcase. So if somebody 
is in a wheelchair and they're not sure if they're going to be able to navigate or get around that place of business or that event venue, having those tours available and linked right on your listing, that can make them a little more comfortable so they can actually see the space before they're physically in it and understand if they're going to have room to move their wheelchair around. Um, and then again, also, you know, photography, we all have photography of our places of business. So utilizing that to really showcase what the meeting space looks like, what the um, venue or restaurant, anything like that, so that people get an idea beforehand and know whether their accessibility needs are going to be met in that space. So once we moved on from starting to do um, accessibility blogs and highlighting and featuring some of these different partners and what they were already doing, we also created an accessibility landing page. So you can see that here at visitrally.com slash all access. Um, this landing page links back to things to do for visitors with disabilities, but it also highlights and showcases some of those blogs that we've done over the years. And then, you know, one of the most important things I think is providing resources. Um, so on this website, we showcase City of Raleigh's Universal Access and the Arts, um, giving links to that, making the arts more accessible for everyone. Our Duke Energy Center for Perform Performing Arts and now our Raleigh Convention Center as well are part of the Culture City programming. So if you're not familiar with Culture City, it is a national program um, and event venues can join into it to make sure that all performances and events that take place at their venue um, are sensory inclusive. So this includes having staff training to make sure everything's sensory inclusive for patrons attending, but then also sensory bags that come with things like fidget tools. So if you have, you know, kids coming to a theater play, having these bags available that the parents can get, and then they have the fidget tool so they can actually sit, enjoy the experience, but also still use the fidget tool. And um, that way it's a better experience for everyone. And then also verbal cue cards are another thing. So I really recommend looking into Culture City um, and what they offer. But if your venues in the area are willing to do that buy-in, um, it can really help make event venues and events in that area uh, inclusive for everyone, especially those with sensory needs. And then finally is like our Triangle Rock Club. So you can see in the image here, this is a photo of the adaptive climbing um, opportunities that the Rock Club offers. So again, just linking back to what your other partners are already doing in the community and really showcasing that so that people know what opportunities they have available. And I wanted to hit on just what I've seen a couple other destinations do. Um, I know we in Raleigh, you know, are more of that urban city center. So thinking back out, if you are a location that has more natural and outdoor activities, how you can implement these things as well. So I really love, this is from the Outer Banks website. Um, the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau does access, has an accessible beaches page. So on this page, it showcases Moby Mat locations, which is what is demonstrated in the picture here. And these are portable non-slip wheelchair beach access mats so that folks in a wheelchair can access the beach just like everyone else. Um, so showcasing where those mats can be picked up, locations where they're available, and then also those beach wheelchair access locations, making sure that everyone knows where those are at, which um, you know public access points are the most accessible and that they're gonna have the easiest time getting on and off of the beach, things like that, um, can go a long way in the planning and making people feel comfortable with visiting those locations. And then, also their Project Lifesaver program. Um, Project Lifesaver is primarily for folks with Alzheimer's and dementia and for their caregivers specifically. So again, just providing those resources to people all in one concise place so that they can have the best experience and still come on vacation and experience the beach with where somebody may have thought before they can't. Another example of this is Explore Brevard. Um, they have a insider tips waterfalls page. So again, this is a page that probably already existed, but adding in details like the one you can see pictured here with the um, Batson Creek Falls. So giving notes that, you know, if you want to go explore waterfalls, this specific one is much more accessible for not only wheelchairs, but also more kid friendly. So I think that's an important component to think about as well with your partners. Sometimes things that are more kid friendly are also 
uh, just more accessible for anyone of anyone of varying abilities, but also especially with wheelchair access. So, you know, that can be a good way to start to think through what your partners are already doing and um, what's the most accessible. But, you know, just listing out for people so they know and they can get an idea of, oh, I can specifically go and see this waterfall has um, 20 foot tall cascade. So a beautiful large waterfall that they can still access even if they're in a wheelchair. So as we continue to evolve, um, we hosted All Access Wake County, which was a training summit uh, for our partners. And the main goal of the summit was overall just to increase awareness and the services for visitors with disabilities all across Wake County. So um, there were a few purposes behind this. Um, you know, it kind of primarily started with our lead conference, which I will talk about shortly, but making sure our partners in the community were prepared before that conference. So we wanted to make sure that all of our hospitality partners were educated educated, were trained, that they knew the best practices for servicing guests with accessibility challenges and opportunities, um, but then also encourage them, as Christina had already talked about previously, go beyond those minimum ADA requirements. You know, yes, for businesses to open, they have to fit, fill those requirements, but that doesn't always mean that your venue or um, place of business is fully accessible to people. So it really encouraging them to move beyond those basic requirements and do the most to make it accessible to all visitors, um, regardless of their ability. So for the implementation of this conference, we hosted it and you can see a photo here. This was a image from the conference or from the summit that we held. So this was in November of 2019 that we hosted this. And again, it was training and awareness um, building for restaurants, hotels, attractions, retailers, event venues, and more. So we invited any of any and all of our partners that wanted to come to attend this. Um, we were very happy to have over 150 hospitality partners join this very first one. And the kind of the big draw we also had was having our opening keynote presentation um, by Justin, Justin Skizix and Patrick Gray. So they are the authors of a book called I'll Push You, which um, goes through their journey of being the first to complete the 500 mile Camino de Santiago trail. Um, in Spain, and Justin is wheelchair bound. So being able to be a person in a wheelchair and with his friend Patrick and go through and do that 500 mile Camino Trail, I personally wouldn't be able to do the Camino Trail and I have the use of both of my legs. So to be wheelchair bound and be able to do that trail is just so impressive. And so they made a, they wrote a book all about their experience and what it took to persevere and do that trail. Um, so they were wonderful keynote speakers to kind of talk on a few options. And again, really focusing on being outdoors and in nature, but having things be accessible enough for someone in a wheelchair, for a person in a wheelchair to still have that experience of uh, hiking the Camino Trail. And then we also included um, various breakout sessions. And part of these breakouts were really meant to provide varying levels of education and opportunity for our hospitality partners. So we had various um, training sessions on making content more, uh, making digital content more accessible. We also had sessions on just basic ADA compliance and how to go beyond that on disability etiquette, um, training with appropriate language and terminology for your frontline staff. So thinking when someone's checking in frontline at the hotel, making sure the folks that they're, those first interactions they're having are being trained um, and know the appropriate language and terms to use. And then also thinking through um, basic ADA requirements for specific to accommodations and then how to find those requirements, um, whether it's ASL interpretation, audio descriptions, um, various things like that, where they can find those resources and where they can find the trainings for all of that for any of their staff. So moving on, at the same time in November 2019, um, as we were hosting the All Access Wake County program, we also launched on our Visit Raleigh website, AudioI. So this, um, you can see it right here on the right. This accessibility toolbar is now on our website. Anytime you go to our website, you can see that bar on the side and click on it. And it really just 
takes our digital experience to another level, making sure that visitors of all abilities are able to access it. So whether it's changing the colors, font sizes, um, giving you the closed caption descriptions, various things like that, AudioEye really integrates all of that into our website and has a lot of components that folks can adjust to make their digital and online experience the best. And I'm not going to go over again, Christina covered very well the web content accessibility guidelines. So this helps the, with those guidelines in providing a fully customizable digital experience and making sure your website adheres to those guidelines. So you can go to audioi.com to read more or go to our visitraleigh.com website and um, use that tool yourself and actually adjust and see what all it can do. So then moving forward, um, we, as a, I work in the public relations department, so, you know, we also wanted to include these accessibility components and highlight with our media that Raleigh is an accessible destination. So we, as a department, um, researched accessible media of varying abilities, some wheelchair, people in a wheelchair, some uh, blind or low vision people, various um, just, you know, low media that were in the area that write about travel and destinations and what their experience is like. So last October, in conjunction with Visit North Carolina, we hosted Penny Zibula, who you can see is pictured here. Um, she is a freelancer, but also has her Instagram and website, Six Legs Will Travel. So they were here for the in-state media mission. And then you can see pictured there, her dog, Splendid, her guide dog. Um, Splendid is wonderful. But we were able to set up not only for her attending the media mission, but then also some other activities to do in the destination and highlight some of our accessible components. So one of the things she did, which is what's featured here is a tactile tour of the North Carolina Museum of Art. And if you're thinking, yes, she is getting to touch a Rodin sculpture, which I am very jealous of, um, but it's a wonderful thing that the Museum of Art offers to blind or low vision um, visitors where they can set up a custom tour with, you know, the appropriate people on staff there and they will tell them about the various pieces of art in the museum and then give them the opportunity to actually touch it. And that was one thing that Penny, when I spoke to her after, she was just blown away the fact that they allowed her to touch the exhibits in the North Carolina Museum of Art because a lot of museums don't offer that. So again, this was something that our North Carolina Museum of Art already had the tactile tour in place. We just brought it to life and wanted to highlight more how visitors with blind or low vision can do this experience. And then also highlighting, you know, audio tours that they have. And um, they have some deeper dives into history tours or even tours available in varying languages. So making sure that all of our visitors are aware of that. One other thing we had Penny um, visit is our 8-bit to 5G augmented reality mural. So you may be thinking, how does someone blind or low vision see a mural that's in the destination? Um, but in the planning stages of this mural, it was great because they were really passionate about including a braille description for the mural. So that way, um, you know, if someone's either low vision or blind, they may only see certain colors or certain aspects of this mural. Um, the mural itself showcases the evolution of technology and kind of gaming history and how it's changed over the years. So, you know, folks may have a passion still for video games, technology, esports, things like that. And being able to include them as an active part in the community where even if they can't fully see the image as it, or the mural as it is displayed, they can still read the braille description and understand what is there. So I thought that was a great component that was added into that mural. And I know all destinations have murals. So this could be something to try to talk to with your um, town or city parks department is could a braille description of murals be added in beside it so that uh, people of all abilities and all vision levels are able to experience and see them. So moving into our lead conference. Um, so this was hosted actually just last month at the beginning of August. 
And we did this in collaboration with the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts and Raleigh Arts. So this conference is the premier event for arts and accessibility for cultural venues. And we definitely have plenty of that here in Raleigh. Um, so we were excited to bring this conference in. We were supposed to host it a couple of years ago, but due to the pandemic, it got delayed. But nevertheless, that gave us more opportunity for our hospitality partners to be aware and involved and also make accessibility adjustments to their um, places of business. So this conference allowed folks to come in and do idea brainstorming. They got to listen to expert panels. Uh, they did networking, making connections, practical, they learned practical tactics to utilize in their business. Um, one of those included learning things like the yardstick method and making sure that, you know, a yardstick is pretty much the length or the width of a wheelchair. So making sure that somebody who's in a wheelchair with a yardstick length can make it around tables, let's say, in a restaurant or, you know, can get around the various, you know, chairs and, you know, um, the meal placement, making sure wheelchairs can reach and access that. So they participated in a lot of those practical tactics like that. And then they also had, again, some experiential opportunities as well. And one component of this that we were able to, with the city of Raleigh, offer to our partners before this conference came is working with Abler. Um, they offer online trainings. So those were provided to partners that they could attend before the conference came into town. And then those trainings also ended up providing checklists. So there were separate checklists checklist specific to if you are a hotel partner, if you're a restaurant partner, if you own an event venue or, or a um, conference, you know, conference meeting space, um, if you are a attraction or a museum. So it was nice to have customized checklists available for our different partners. So they really know what are the main accessibility options that um, they need to look at and make sure they're catering to for all of these visitors. And then finally, I just wanted to hit on one other thing, um, making sure that you're making events accessible. So again, we all host events in our destinations. Um, if you're not familiar, World of Bluegrass is something that we have hosted this year is the 10th year in Raleigh. Um, so if you don't have plans the last weekend in September, September 30th through October 1st, come to Raleigh, experience bluegrass. Um, but it's a great event that has a lot of free music venue free music stages and opportunities all throughout downtown Raleigh. And, you know, part of the event over the few year, last few years has changed to make everything free so that there are no monetary eliminations. But also the organizations involved um, really wanted to also eliminate accessibility barriers as well. So these are just a few things that have been implemented over the years uh, during this festival. And there are things to kind of think through with any events that are happening in your area to not only ask the event planner or partner about these things, but also highlighting them if you're doing a festival guide or a blog or anything like that, um, or just asking, is there ways we can incorporate and weave this in? So again, reserved and accessible seating is always is kind of, to me, the easy one that a lot of times is available also based on ADA requirements. Um, offering sighted guides. So that's what you can see here. We actually have a group of volunteers that is set up before the event and they are they go through training to be sighted guides. And so we have those available so that when people are coming, they can have a sighted guide lead them through the festival footprint um, all throughout Fayetteville Street. And along with that, also having designated quiet spaces. So making sure that right off of Fayetteville Street, but also in our convention center for the conference, portion beforehand, that there's quiet spaces available. If people just need to step away from the large crowd that's on Fayetteville Street or in the convention center, that those designated spaces are notated on a map and available for them. Also having assisted listening devices, so especially with like the concerts at Red Hat Amphitheater, um, but also for conference sessions. So if they're sitting in a session, making sure listening devices are available, or if it's in um, needing a sign language interpreter, making sure all of that is thought of ahead of time. And then also having accessible restrooms. Again, that typically goes with ADA requirements, but making sure that's available, you know, in all aspects of the festival or event 
And then finally offering accessible cab listings. It's something we don't think about a lot. And you know, we as a destination even had to ramp up this a bit more with our lead conference, but making sure that if someone is you know, flying into Raleigh and they're in a wheelchair, that when they're at the airport, they know what cab companies they can utilize to then get from the airport to downtown Raleigh. Um, or if they're going from downtown to another area in our destination, like over to Cary, that they know what cab companies are the easiest for them to access and to have uh, no issues with getting in, and out, getting in or out of the cab, ha having room for their wheelchair, things like that. And so I think that is all of my slides and I will pass it back over to Amanda. Thank you, Jessica. Um, hopefully this presentation will help you look at how accessible your destination and marketing efforts are and some first steps you can take to improve in those areas. Uh, some of the key ta takeaways are to commit. Commit to acquiring the expertise and devoting resources, whether internal or external, really identifying who's gonna be your top ex accessibility expert. Also being intentional, meet people where they are and help provide them with the information for their planning. Make it easier for them to discover your destination and see themselves there. Thinking about being representative in your imagery, adding alt text for people using readers, provide information on accessible experiences in your destination and promote accessible lodging. Being sincere and authentic in your efforts. Travelers and their families are looking for those that are making the effort. Don't be intimidated and take those first steps. Educate yourself. There are certifications you can get, like High Point was the first North Carolina GMO to achieve the Certified Autism Center designation. And be genuine in your attempt to be accommodating and welcoming to all, and it will be recognized as such. Consider the full journey. How people are finding out about your destination. How will people get there? How will they get around once they're in your destination? And where will they stay and what will they do? Can you design an accessible experience? Is there a guide who understands their needs? If you decide to offer trainings, include the frontline employees. How many front desk employees know why the ADA rooms should be reserved as a last to sell unless they're specifically requested? Um, you might be surprised in your destination how many partners in your community already have these accessibility programs and features that you can highlight. Engage with your stakeholders. What's good for the visitors is also good for the community. Create a local panel of stakeholders or experts within your destination who truly understand the issues. They live and work where your visitors will vacation. Explain the why, show the data, ask to be invited to the table when there are conversations about new developments for the community and visitors, and think about infrastructure on a scale of universally access accessible, not just ADA compliant. And get started. Everyone has to start somewhere. You can build on that. It might seem overwhelming as everyone accessibility needs are different, so you don't expect perfection. You're gonna make mistakes along the way and attempt to get in there, but taking that first step is really important. And this isn't about singling out one group, but about being inclusive. Increasing accessibility gives people more time with their family. It allows a person with a wheelchair to go to the beach with the rest of the family, or someone who's blind or low vision to be able to go to a museum of art and experience it in a way, just like their friend who may not have vision disabilities. Um, our industry is really about experiences. So giving everyone in your destination the opportunity to experience all that you have to offer. I am curious if you all on this call or webinar also have a blog or landing page talking about accessibility in your destination. Please share it with me. Um, we want to help amplify your destination and your accessibility components within your destination. So please feel free to share. At this time, we'll take um, any questions you might have. I will say that this is recorded and will be available following this presentation on partners.visitnc.com. And we will also have additional resources available to you as well. You can feel free to reach out to me um, and I can send you that list. And also we'll hope to have that on the partners page as well. And just a reminder, our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, October 13th at 10 a.m. And that will be resources for your local tourism related businesses. Does anybody have any questions?
Well, I want to make sure that I thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate it and, and look forward to learning more about all the accessibility features within your destination and being a resource, all of us on the call today, if you have any questions, want to follow up individually or discuss more about how your destination can be more accessible. Thank you all for your time.